Hello, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this year's Wolfson Research Event 2022. I'm Nancy Karaman. I'm a PhD student at Wolfson, and I'm also this year's event chair. Just one member of a committee of about eight to nine people, depending on who you count as part of the committee. But it's been a really big effort to make this happen, so I really appreciate all of you coming here this morning to our first time having the event in person in, I think, two years. So we're really excited about that. We've got a really great lineup of speakers. We've got several keynote speakers, but uh, I think I'm also most excited about our oral presenters and poster presenters, who are Wolfson students or Wolfson alumni, recent alumni, um, who will be speaking about a huge range of topics, anything from biomedical research and devices to physics and even astrophysics to uh, unicorns, notably. <laughs> and then we've also got some uh, other amazing speakers on a literally kind of anything you could think about. So I like to think that we're kind of representing the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature of what Wolfson College is really about generally um, with our really diverse um, student body and composition of disciplines and things like that. So I don't want to go on too long, but I just wanted to say thank you all so much for coming. And um, just a quick note that our first oral presentation block will start after uh, Jane's speech. So just oral presenters in the first block, just so you know, that's what's happening. Um, but yeah, besides that, thank you so much for coming and um, let's get this started. Oh, and of course, here's Jane Clark, our amazing president. <laughs> So, so thank, thank you, Nancy, and, and the rest of the committee. To, to put this together is an enormous amount of work. Um, and I'll reflect on that a little at, at the end. But um, I want just to start this off by telling you why I think research, this event and research is so important. Um, I just spent the last two weeks um, looking after grandchildren. Um, and... It seems to me when you watch a child, you understand what a true researcher, I would say a true scientist, but, but, the, but the attitudes that you need to be a good scientist are those that you need to do research in any discipline, are absolutely personified in a small child. It's this desire to find out about the world about them, this endless curiosity that is completely draining when you're looking after why this what what happens if i do this what do I, and, and 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 but but that absolute curiosity which because it's there in a child means it's there in every human being and it's something which we have to remember to nurture it's something which which children come with and that somehow, sometimes through traditional forms of schooling or don't ask questions, be seen, not heard, that sort of thing, which if we're not careful, we can wear away and people never rediscover it. It's the willingness to go out and explore something they don't know, unafraid. To try something they've not tried before apart from trying food they've not tried before. <laughs> um, but, but to try something they've not tried before and give it a good go. And that's something else that we need to capture when we're doing research. To try and think outside the box. The, the, the way that a child, when they put... You know how you do a jigsaw puzzle, don't you? you? You get all the edges, you find the four corners, you get the edges, and then you work your way in. That's not how a child does a jigsaw puzzle. We've learnt to do it, but they kind of find the yellow bits. Or they, they do it in a different way to the, the way that we've been told that this works. A good researcher is prepared to try things in a different way not just to follow the standard way, because that's how we've told you you've got to do it. And again, somehow we, we grind that out in schools. You know, No, this is how you do long multiplication. It's actually we do it differently now than I was taught that was the only way to do it. But, but you know what I mean, that this sort of the grinding thing. Um, and then it's not being worried about being wrong. It's not being afraid of getting it wrong. And that marks out a good researcher. 
I, I, I say that my favorite times, this is right, my favorite times in, as, as a researcher, as a scientist, have been the times when I've been sitting in, in, in my office, which is no, not the best times when you're a scientist, and, and a student comes in and he says, Jane, look at my results. You know, I don't understand them. And you look at them and you say, yeah, well, what did you mess up? You clearly messed up. Go away and do it again. So they go away, and two, three weeks later, they come in and they say, nah. You know, the results are still the same. And I say, well, well you've clearly not. Go back to the very beginning. Remake all your solutions. Go and make new protein. Throw it away. Something must have happened. So three months later, they come back in and say, look, I got the same results. Then you go, let's go to the pub, because we have discovered something really exciting, <laughs> because all our theory was wrong. We've seen something nobody's ever seen before. That is the nature of discovery. And I hope and trust that in your lives, you'll all have some of those moments where you realize that being wrong was the very best thing that could have happened. My favorite quote is, I think, supposed to be from Einstein. I don't know if it's, early, but you know, what is research? Well, if we knew what it was, we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it? And I cannot think of a place where we, as curious people, would have more opportunities to do research than at Wilson, than at Cambridge. Just think how many different opinions we might get on our research if we just go and talk about it. Today, you'll be talking about research you're in your field to people who are completely outside that field. The challenge, can you make us understand what you're doing? But the challenge to the audience is you're not here just to sit and clap. You're here to question what you hear, to try and see if there's any way that you could look at that same problem in a different way, or you could contribute with your different skills to the problem that, is, that, that the people are investigating. I, I keep sort of saying to, you know, Adam Rutherford says all the best science is done in the bar, but uh, it, it, all the best research will benefit from those conversations about what turns you on and what you've learned. What are your problems? We don't want to just know how clever you are. I could give you a talk about all the things I discovered, but the best things were the, were the getting there, right? And I do hope that you all today have come here not just to present your work, but to learn from everyone else and to contribute to the research by asking questions. No questions are stupid. There may be stupid answers, but no questions are stupid because you may be looking at a, quest a problem somebody's trying to solve in a completely different way than the one that they've thought of. So I think as a college where most of our students do research, most of our students are graduate students, and our undergraduate students, some of those are doing research as well. This is a contribution that we are making, not just to, to ourselves, but to the world. The mission of Wilson College is to give every member of the, the college the opportunity to develop to their full potential, and then have them go out and change the world. It's through research that we will do that. And so thank you for having me here. Thank you for organizing it. I am going to have fun for the next two days. So uh, great. Thank you, Nancy. So my name is Jiayi, and I'll be moderating the first oral presentation session today. And before I begin, just to remind on the presenters that we will be timekeeping. So 
Each presenter has 10 minutes of presentation followed by 3 minutes of Q&A. And my colleague Charlotte here will show the green card when there's... Okay, there's no green card, sorry. <laughs> the yellow card when there's one minute remaining and the red one means time's up and you'll have to stop. So our first speaker today will be Aidan Woodcock who will be presenting the value of true belief. Um, so I should just start, yeah? Okay, hello, thank you. Um, so my research centers around the question, what should I believe? Um, and I guess today I just want to talk through a couple of approaches to answering that question, and then just sketch in sort of broad outline the sort of project that I have. Um, <clears throat> so traditionally there have been kind of two approaches, two kinds of answers philosophers give to the question, what, I should, what should I believe? Um, the first kind of answer, and I think the dominant one in philosophy, uh, is an evidentialist sort of answer. It says, believe only what you have sufficient evidence for. Now, I know the picture connotes kind of there someone doing an experiment and gathering, you know, like experimental evidence, but it's not, you know, meant, evidence isn't meant to be read that, uh, that restrictively, you know. Uh, ordinary sense experience gives us evidence, testimony gives us evidence. Basically, evidence is anything that's sort of thought of as bearing on the truth uh, of the thing you're interested in. Uh, evidence is a guide to truth. So evidentialists say, base your beliefs on your evidence. Um, the other dominant strand is the sort of pragmatist answer to the question. So pragmatists say, believe whatever you do best by believing. Um, now this isn't always gonna give you a different outcome to the evidentialists, right? Uh, often it's going to be best for you to believe, base your beliefs on your evidence, but sometimes they might come apart, right? Um, and so let's see a couple, of, a couple of motivations for these views. So um, the motivation for evidentialism uh, is often, uh, the one that's often still quoted is sort of the original one, the one from Clifford's Ethics of Belief. So I'm just gonna read his motivating, his motivating example. So he has the following case. A ship owner was about to send to sea an emigrant ship. He knew that she was old and not over well built at the first but she had seen many seas and climbs and had often needed repairs. Doubts had been suggested to him that possibly she was not seaworthy. These doubts preyed upon his mind and made him unhappy. He thought that perhaps he ought to have her thoroughly overhauled and refitted, even though this should put him at great expense. Before the ship sailed, however, he succeeded in overcoming these melancholy reflections. He said to himself that she had gone safely through many voyages and weathered so many storms that it was idle to suppose she would not come safely home from this trip also. He would put his trust in providence, which could hardly fail to protect all these unhappy families that were leaving their fatherland to seek for better times elsewhere. In such way, he acquired a sincere and comfortable conviction that his vessel was thoroughly... Uh, I can't see because of that. Thing, uh, thoroughly uh, uh, and seaworthy. He watched her departure with a light heart. Uh, and he got his insurance money when she went down mid-ocean and told no tales. Um, so Clifford here thinks you have a duty, a duty to believe based on your evidence. And in this example, it seems like it's grounded in the sign of the same way as a moral duty. But the important thing, I think, to think about is the sort of different versions of this story we could tell. So importantly, Clifford thinks that the, um, the ship owner would have done something wrong even if the ship had not gone down in mid-ocean, right? Even if the ship had made it across the Atlantic perfectly safe and sound, there would still have been something wrong about the way the ship owner formed his beliefs, and that would be that it wasn't based in his evidence. Um, so that is kind of the motivation, or the original motivation, for evidentialism. And then you get a kind of different sort of case that's supposed to motivate pragmatism. So, Pragmatism, I, I've invented this case, but it's not really mine. There are loads of these in the literature that get cooked up. Um, here's a sort of different kind of case that's supposed to give you a different sort of intuition. Um, imagine that Mark has been diagnosed with a form of cancer that has a six-month survival rate of 5% and a one-year survival rate of a half percent. Indeed, all Mark's evidence points overwhelmingly to him having only months to live. However, Mark also correctly believes that believing his cancer will go into remission will significantly increase the likelihood of it actually going into remission. Holding this belief will increase his chances of survival. I've made up some percentages there too. Um, so Mark, importantly, has every reason to live. 
And in the few cases where this kind of cancer does go into remission, the quality of life for survivors is good. So it seems that whilst Mark should not believe he'll go into remission if he aims to believe the truth, that is, if he bases his beliefs on his evidence, uh, he will be best served by believing that it will. And so the pragmatist says, look, whenever these things come apart, whenever what's best for you and what your evidence is come apart, you should believe what's best for you, you know, not what your evidence points to. And this is really where the tension between the two views originates. And this is sort of the point of departure for my research. Um, I think the traditional debate between pragmatists and evidentialists sort of came to a kind of stalemate. Right? You just kept describing these sorts of cases, and there was a sort of blunt clash of intuitions. Um, so how can we make progress on this debate? Well, I think, and I guess I'm not the only person to have thought this, it's quite a standard move in the literature now, but I think that the difference between the two views is the way they value truth. Right? Um, so it's important to note that both evidentialists and pragmatists think believing the truth is valuable, but they think it's valuable for different reasons. Um, evidentialists think that truth is the aim of belief, right? Belief comes with an aim, it aims at getting things right, um, and evidence is our best subjective guide to the truth, right? We don't have direct access to the way the world is, so we have to base our beliefs on what's our subjective guide to the truth, and evidence just is definitionally that thing, right? So we ought to follow our evidence. Um, by contrast, pragmatists seem to think that truth is valuable because it's instrumentally useful in achieving things that we want, right? Um, so here, the pragmatist is thinking, not that belief has any aim or anything like that. That seems like a philosophical superstition, right? Truth is just a tool, an instrument, that we can use in getting what we want. And it's often very useful to have true beliefs, right? So that, to me, seems to be like the fundamental difference between the two views. And so we can ask the question, which, now, now we frame things this way, which if either of these views is correct. Um, and so what I want to do with the remaining time I've got is just to sketch not really a view I'm committed to, but an approach that in the first part of my PhD I took to sort of answering some of that question. Um, and in particular, it's an approach that kind of argues for evidentialism, although I feel now more pushed towards the pragmatist side of things. Um, so I think the important th th thesis for the evidentialist is, is thesis called veritism. Um, now, uh, whenever you're giving a presentation, always make sure to misstate your main thesis, and that's exactly what I've done here. So I've said truth, veritism is the view that truth is the only intrinsically valuable property of belief. Really, what I should have said there, just for clarity's sake, is that truth is the only intrinsically valuable property in deciding what to believe, right? And I think that the, the plausibility of evidentialism turns on the plausibility of that thesis. Because if that thesis is true, then making a rational decision about what to believe is the same thing as rationally pursuing the truth, right? And since evidence, just by definition, is your subjectively best guide to truth, right? Veritism plus, rational, plus being rational in deciding what to believe entails evidentialism. Um, and so if you like metaphors, you can imagine yourself as the archer and the truth is the dartboard, and evidence is the thing that helps you aim, right? Yeah, it's the thing that guides you, and if truth is the only valuable thing, the only thing, yeah, and therefore evidence is the only thing you should use in aiming, that basically just is evidentialism, the view. Um, okay, so how could we actually argue for this? Well, here's the strategy I've been pursuing. Um, first, uh, sorry, first I think I should say is we have to assume from the get-go that we know more than nothing about what we ought to believe, right, and the principles that govern uh, true belief. So what we really want to say is there are some cases about which we can take our, our judgments as data, right, judgments about what we ought to believe, judgments about which principles our belief system ought to follow. And we want to identify those cases, um, and then we want to make the following kind of argument. We show that assuming veritism, we can explain those cases. We can explain what we ought to believe or the principles that our beliefs ought to conform to as the rational pursuit of um, accuracy or of truth in those cases. And we also want to show that without assuming veritism, we can't explain those cases. Um, 
And if we can do this, that will confer some support on veritism, uh, and it will thereby confer support on evidentialism. Um, so very quickly, I've, I've only got a few seconds left, but I'm just going to sort of sketch you through one key, sorry, walk you through one key example, the, the sort of paradigmatic example in my sort of field of, of trying to pull that argument off. So the argument is sort of an argument for probabilism. So we treat beliefs as credences, where credences are like degrees of belief, where you have sort of real numbered values for all the propositions you have beliefs about um, that represent the extent to which you believe them, the higher the number, the greater the degree of belief in that proposition. And then we try and argue for this thing called probabilism. Now, it's assumed that probabilism is uncontroversial, um, and so there's an accuracy argument for probabilism, but I'm out of time, so I will just literally read it, and then I will stop. Um, <laughs> um, we want to identify a set of functions that measure the accuracy of your credence function. We then argue for a principle of rational choice, right, saying that it's irrational to hold any credence function for which there is some other credence function that's guaranteed to be more accurate. And we want to prove that for every, and then we prove that for every non-probabilistic credence function, there's some credence function that is guaranteed to be more accurate. So why does this argument rely on veritism? Well, it's the middle premise, right? Because um, that principle is stated only in terms of truth, it relies on veritism, and because and veritism is the thesis that effectively is required for evidentialism, um, it entails you know, that kind of argument vindicate, is vindicated by evidentialism and not otherwise. Okay, sorry, that was a bit rushed towards the end. I'm going to stop. Thank you. All right, thank you, Aidan, very much. So we'll now take questions from the audience. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Aidan, for your talk. Um, one, so of course, I'm not, not so much familiar with the precise terminologies that you use, but one thing that I find a bit weird, so to speak, is this idea that you decide what to believe. Because I feel like, how should you, like, I mean, okay, now in the, in the one example you, you were talking about, you said it's useful to decide X for, you know, for your cancer example and so on. But I don't know, if I, if I know factually that it's just different, I find it very hard to conceive that, that just, I just say, okay, I ignore what I know, uh, and for useful reasons, I now say, okay, this is, this is what, I, what I want to believe now. So, so, so this is, so yeah, so maybe this, this notion, deciding what to believe, I find a bit difficult to understand. Because for me, like a belief, if you really use that word, as I say, maybe I don't have your precise words, a belief is not something you really decide on, in a sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, to some degree, I, I, I just agree with that, right? I mean, I think there's this, there's this phenomenon. Uh, in the literature, it's called transparency, where in first-person deliberation about what to believe, you can really only decide, you can really only, if you don't like the word, you can really only come to believe something for truth-conducive reasons, right? Reasons relating to the truth of the proposition you're believing. Um, but notice that that's only, in fact, true in first-person deliberation about what to believe, right? Presumably, you have a lot of beliefs um, that you, uh, yeah, that you don't form by deliberating about them. And presumably, there are sort of a lot of, like, long-range control you can have over what you believe. So I guess the question, really, in, in answering normative questions about what you ought to believe, uh, is really, do you see that inability to choose what to believe in first-person deliberation as a problem, right? So I think it's not a problem. I think it's kind of like a contingent limitation of, on human psychology. Um, and it is, of course, true that you, well, you know, if it turns out you ought to believe something else, normatively speaking, you can't bring that about by just deciding to believe it. But there probably is some more distal procedure you could undergo that would, with a reasonable degree of likelihood, bring about those, those sorts of beliefs. I mean, particularly if you think evidentialism gives you the norm, then it seems very easy to bring about those beliefs. You just reflect on your evidence better than you were reflecting before. Pragmatists might have to you know, advocate a more circuitous procedure. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, there's much more to be said, but that's a good point, yeah. yeah. All right, we can take one more question. 
Hi, thanks very much for your talk. I have to think, do you not think there's a merit to the argument, certainly in favour of evidentialism, that what is true and what's being observed is true for everyone, whereas if you take the pragmatist argument, believe what is best for you to believe, well, what's best for me to believe to pursue my personal goals can be at the expense of other people. In China right now, Shanghai is under full lockdown and people are starving. It's best for Xi Jinping to believe for him to believe what is best for him to believe is what will secure him an unprecedented third term. Zero COVID works because it's associated with me, so it must work and I must continue to believe that. What is best for evidentialists is, is does the evidence support it? The answer is no. And him believing what is best for him to believe is causing harm to hundreds of millions of people right now. So doesn't the pragmatist case really fall apart whenever humans have very, very different goals and projects and concerns? Good question. Um, again, I think my answer to that would be very lengthy, um, but I think, I think really what you need to decide is what you think like being practically rational in general is, right? So really what pragmatists say is you should be practically rational in forming your beliefs, right? And um, a lot of people particularly people who come from the literature I, I work in, use basically decision theory as their best theory of practical rationality, and that is inherently individualist. So people like me are just going to dig their heels in and say, really, no, there are no normative facts beyond like what is individually rational. Um, and there are then the people who argue, no, of course, there are, there are moral facts out there. that. Um, but importantly, the pragmatist is open. That's a p p position that's open to the pragmatist. Right? They can say that practical rationality uh, includes considering those moral reasons, and somebody who's, who's not considering them is being practically irrational. So really, they're, they're the way that the pragmatist who's moved by your, your, your point would respond would be by saying, well, we should take those considerations inside the account of what it is to be practically reasonable in forming your beliefs. And so they would then argue that Xi Jinping was being irrational in you know, taking on the assumptions of what you said. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So next up, we have Anna Maria Villavicious, who will be presenting Dead Butterflies and Cactus Flowers. Um, okay. Hi. So we're taking a sharp turn from philosophy into queer literature. Uh, <laughs> I would like to start this presentation with the idea that language is often a trap of inescapable violence for transgender and queer subjects, a twisted snare that silences critical nuances even as it pushes to name them. And this is an important idea which I really would like to state that doesn't come only from me. This is an idea that has been thought of and has been reflected on by incredible theorists, amongst them Susan Stryker, Judith Butler, but particularly Susan Stryker. She goes into the idea of trans subjectivity and talks about how for trans subjects, speaking themselves always renders a part of them quiet. And this is due to the impossibility of naming within our social constructs and within our language without falling into gender. Gender seems to be like this inescapable trap that transgender subjects always have to deal with and always have to live with. And what both of these authors talk about and point to is a pain ciphered in language, something that is made invisible and at the same time always renewed and always opened by language. And something that I believe is a critical part of queer narratives, the wound, so to speak, around which they are built. Throughout the rest of my presentation, I will be expanding on this idea and highlighting the tension at the core of queer narratives, the pull between beauty and ugliness, love and violence, power and precariousness, through and with two particular Latin American novels 
Tengo Miedo Torero by Pedro Lemebel, which was translated by Catherine Silver as My Tender Matador, and Las Malas by Camila Sosa Villada, soon to be published in translation, a translation by Kit Maud titled Bad Girls. Uh, because these novels were written in Spanish, and because my research is conducted primarily on the source material in Spanish, there are some quotations in Spanish in this presentation. I will be saying the translated versions, the originals will be in the slides, and whenever I do say something in Spanish, the translation will be in the slides. But before I truly get into it, I would like to talk a bit about what these novels are about, because it is essential, obviously. Um, so originally published in 2001 in Chile, Le Mebel's Tengo Miedo Torero tells the convoluted love story between La Loca del Frente, a poor cross-dressing homosexual man, and Carlos, a left-wing guerrilla member of the Frente Patriotico Manuel Rodriguez during the spring of 1986. Le Mebel situates this story within the real political conflicts occurring in, C in Chile and in Santiago at the time, and also within the very real yet ultimately unsuccessful attack that guerrillas were planning on dictator Augusto Pinochet's life. Um, but what is very interesting about this book is that the love story is the core of the narrative. La Loca del Frente is the most important character and her experience becomes the focal point and it becomes the place in which political and personal struggles for freedom converge. Las Malas by Camila Sosa Villada for its part is was published in 2019 in Argentina, and it narrates the story of a group of transgender prostitutes in the city of Córdoba. Sosa focuses her narrative on the lives and familial ties of the self-proclaimed travestis of the Parque Sarmiento, narrating their experiences as a group, as well as Camila's, the main character's own personal story within the context of the oppressive Argentinian neoliberal society of the 1990s. This story, and what is very interesting about this story, in case the name of the main character didn't tip you off, is that it is semi-autobiographical. It is loosely based on the author's own coming of age and struggles with her experience as a trans woman. In both of these novels, the main characters struggle to find love and carve out livable lives for themselves within systems that refuse to acknowledge their existence or that acknowledge them only in derision, discrimination, and violence. And in both of these novels, that violence ties the queer experience to rage. But despite the oppression, and perhaps also in response to it, La Loca del Frente chooses to embellish her life with love stories and flowers, boleros and embroidery. In the midst of a brutally gray dictatorship and the shadows of a very macho revolution. Similarly, Camila and her bedraggled family of transgender prostitutes make a pink fortress out of an abandoned house and travel every day from that hell no one writes about to bring spring back into the world. The characters cling to beauty for survival and furthermore, they promote it, they remobilize it, they dare to imagine it anew. In other words, they make beauty. These novels, I posit, lean into the wound I was talking about before, choosing to highlight the beauty that paradoxically issues from and decorates its rot. Marked by poverty and illness, drug abuse and loneliness, and embedded in societal and grammatical structures that refuse to allow them a voice, La Loca and Camila speak nonetheless, refashioning language to name themselves and narrate their own experience with it. What striker terms? So, well, first, let's start with establishing queer rage. What striker terms queer rage or transgender rage emerges from the interstices of discursive practices and at the collapse of generic categories? That is to say, it emerges from the wound created by language. And it is a direct product of the shackles of language. But importantly, even though this holds true in both Tengo Miedo Torero and Las Malas, queer rage is always talked through in language as well. In Tengo Miedo Torero and Las Malas, the characters rage against the conventions of the language that holds them. And it is worth noting that one of these examples is feminine pronouns. Both of these novels establish their characters in feminine pronouns. And they, particularly Tengo Miedo Torero, commonly redeem language that is deemed offensive. Uh, this is important in terms like loca, la loca enfrente in Le Mebel's novel. Um, loca is a term that is translated directly to mean queen, and that is true of the term, that is part of the translation, but in Spanish, loca is also the feminine conjugation of insane, and that is why that term is offensive, and that is part of what Lemuel is redeeming when he decides to call his character la loca. 
Um, in Camila Sosa Villada's novel, she very much uses the word travesti throughout the whole novel. The direct translation of travesti is transvestite, but it's a very different term in English than it is in Spanish. In Spanish, travesti refers specifically to transgender women in a particular place in society, poor transgender women, transgender women that live in a situation of precariousness. And Camila Sosa Villada is interested in that specifically because that is what she lived. And that is also tied to rage. So it's very important to note that these terms are brought into the novels for a reason. And these authors are fighting against particular positions in society through their use of these terms. It is key to keep in mind that these novels tie rage not only to language, but to these experiences, the experiences of a material reality. In his poetic political manifesto, Lemebel chides left-wing activists in Chile, telling them to not speak to him about the proletariat because being poor and queer is worse. This indicates one of the most prevalent concerns in his work and sets the groundwork for further concerns that Sosa brings to her novel. La Loca and Camila are, in part because of their gender identities, trapped in precarious situations of poverty that they cannot escape from. This is indicative of their material oppression and it refers to what Butler would call the lived reality of gender, the imposed limits that the empowering choice taken by the characters to revel in calling themselves she imply. This is what Latin American critic Nestor Perlonger refers to when he calls identities becomings. We find and express an identity and society leads us to a place. It ties us to it and thus we become. The rage against these intersecting oppressions is explicitly stated in both novels. Although perhaps more overtly in Sosa Villada's novel with Camila openly accusing systemic oppression when she states that is what we are as a country too the relentless damage to the bodies of travestis, the mark left on certain bodies in an unjust, random, and avoidable way, that mark of hate. The rage against the silence and the complicity of our mothers in the systemic disdain of our existence is something she also talks against. So with all of this, you might be wondering, where, where is beauty? <laughs> um, and the answer is that, I have very little time to tell you the answer, but the answer is that the beauty is in language. Um, these novels <laughs> tie beauty to language and they seem to be pointing at a battle that can only be won in language. I'm going to highlight the key examples of beauty that I find in, this, in these novels. And the first thing that is important for you to keep in mind before I highlight these things is that the beauty to be found in these novels is not the traditionally established beauty. It is not a beauty that relies on balance. It is not a beauty that relies on paleness or on distance from the body. It is an ugly beauty, a contaminated beauty. Like I said before, it comes from a wound. And like Camila Sosa Villada says herself, flowers grow from shit. Um, so the main images that give this presentation their title are the following. As petals fall into the windshield of Carlos's car after a beautiful love story and a spring day, La Loca del Frente says, parecen mariposas muertas, and she turns away. While reminiscing about her youth, Camila describes times in which la vida parecía una flor abriéndose el paso a través de la dura piel de un cactus. These are images that explain the type of beauty at play in these novels. It is a sense of beauty that seems to be decaying and yet simultaneously pushes its way through thick and thorny skins, a beauty that rots, but that is also strong and relentless, able to survive where and when least expected. Um, so I'm gonna end, sadly, there's so much to talk about in these novels, but I wanna end with an idea or a possibility rather that these novels open, a possibility of resistance in their handling of rage and beauty. It is true that language is a violent trap for queer subjects, that there is a wound it continuously slashes open. But it is also true that language can help highlight the beauty to be found, the tender power to be sought in queerness. It is, it seems, in language itself that the battle must be wrought, and in beauty that it can be won. But Camila Sosa Villada said it better. El lenguaje es mío, es mi derecho, me corresponde una parte de él. Voy a destruirlo, a enfermarlo, a confundirlo, a incomodarlo. Voy a despedazarlo y hacerlo renacer tantas veces como sean necesarias. Un renacimiento por cada cosa bien hecha en este mundo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. 
So do we have any questions from the audience? Hello, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, I was just interested in not knowing um, so much about uh, Chilean culture, um, the conceptual category of beauty, because in the history of um, aesthetics and philosophy, often the sublime is used as a category that incorporates an element of displeasure or the ugly, um, which you get in Kant and Hegel and down to contemporary aesthetics. So I was just wondering if that plays a role in your research as a kind of additional uh, conceptual category. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it does play a role. In fact, when you're talking about the type of beauty I'm referring to here, it does get closer to the sublime than it does to the traditionally just very bound idea of beauty. Romantic beauty is what I was referring to. So romantic beauty tends to be about symmetry, about everything just falling together. It's, it's just beauty, right? Whereas the type of beauty I'm referring to here is, as I said, an ugly beauty, and it does come closer to being part of the sublime. The difference, I would say, is the sublime was born from this idea of nature and of something that is so beautiful it kind of overwhelms you. It is overwhelmingly beautiful to a point where it can cause feelings that go beyond those of beauty. Um, the sublime can also famously will cause horror, the feeling of horror, right? Um, but this beauty kind of would wiggle its way in between both of those things. It is a beauty that what it does is decorate something that is ugly. It is a beauty that is born from resistance, which is what I think is so interesting. It is essentially trans subjects, queer subjects, looking at the world and being like, you believe my life to be ugly. If you were to describe my life, you would believe it to be destitute. You would believe it to be gross. And I am going to live this life, and I am going to narrate it, and I am going to make it beautiful. And that is essentially what they're doing and what their resistance lies on. OK, thank you. Do we have any more questions? We have time for one quick one. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I guess, is there any distinction to be made here between the characters um, getting agency by finding beauty and having agency by creating beauty, or are those sort of inextricably intertwined? Um, they are inextricably intertwined, and that is what I think makes it very interesting. These novels, part of the making of beauty and part of the decorating the beauty is the fact that these characters hold on to beauty to live their lives. So La Loca del Frente embroiders, and not only is that her way of decorating her story, but it's literally economically the way that she survives. She embroiders fabric and she sells it, and that is how she maintains herself within the system. Uh, with Camila, obviously it's a little more complicated. She is a prostitute, but she does talk about how decorating her own body and decorating herself to be seen as beautiful is incredibly important for her existence within the society and for her survival, um, and thus, this idea of making beauty becomes literally the way they survive, and also it becomes literally the way they resist, because both of these characters speak in first person and write. And that writing, that taking of a language that isn't supposed to be for you, and making it for yourself only, is an act of resistance, and it is incredibly important. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Yep, next up, we have Anna Lukina, who will pre be presenting Making Sense of Evil Law. Oh, okay, yeah, hear this. Yeah, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, without further ado, I'll start with an image on the slide, which is a painting by one of my favorite artists, Gustav Klimt. It's called Jurisprudence, or the Science of Law, and was the three other paintings commissioned to decorate the Great Hall of the University of Vienna. After Klimt's work was completed in 1903, the artist had to buy his paintings back over a massive public outcry. 
It is not hard to imagine why the painting unsettled its viewers. One reason was that it depicted nudity, of course, but I would like to say that this feeling is more profound. The work was an unfamiliar, in rather bleak, depiction of law. The painting features the slouched and withered body of a man looked down upon by three figures in the background representing truth, law, and justice. It reminds us that law is not just used to render each other their due, but for far more uh, sinister purposes. The idealistic view of law necessarily embodying justice is shattered when we gaze upon legal history. There are many examples that can illustrate this uncomfortable truth about law, but in my work I turn to just three paradigmatic test cases that are Nazi Germany, Stalin Soviet Union, and slavery in the antebellum United States. Like Klimt's painting, they make us recall what Les Green calls immorality that law makes possible, the use of law's many efficient tools to achieve wicked ends. In this presentation, I begin with analyzing this phenomenon by introducing, distinguishing, defining, and ultimately defending the term evil law. First, I will define what evil law is and uh, say how it differs from unjust law. Second, I will say that this difference is not great enough for evil law not to be law in the first place. In my paper, I also address whether the very vocabulary of evil is potentially problematic, but I will park this question for the purposes of my presentation. If you're interested, you can ask about it during the Q&A. I give the following definition of evil law. Evil law is law which, if interpreted according to its best purpose, will enable the infliction of intolerable harm, including atrocities, on victims themselves. I will now go through all of the elements of this definition one by one. The best purpose element is crucial in not just defining evil law, but in distinguishing it from unjust law. It builds on Ronald Dworkin's theory that sees law as an interpretive concept, making the judge's role to look at all legal materials and seek the best possible unifying purpose or point behind them. In cases of unjust law, such interpretation can usually offset some negative consequences of laws like that. But when it comes to evil law, however, redeeming it via interpretation is an impossible task. Thus, in order to determine whether a law is truly evil, one needs to look at its best interpretation. The next element of my definition is intolerable harm, a term the precise meaning of which is rather challenging to find. In constructing my definition of evil law, I find John Stanton Ives' description of horrific crimes as crimes that violate the victim themselves, such as rape or murder, rather than only their rights and interests, such as theft, most relevant. Providing a list of paradigmatic intolerable harms can also be clarifying. To this end, Claudia Card uses what she calls an atrocity paradigm, or acts such as genocide, slavery, torture, and so forth. Finally, we turn to the element of enabling. There is a good reason that I didn't just refer to evil law causing intolerable harm. Of course, there are some evil laws that cause intolerable harm, primarily those that command that intolerable harm be inflicted. One can refer to the so-called Nuremberg laws that stripped Jews of their German citizenship and prohibited romantic relationships between Germans and Jews. However, there are two more types of evil laws one should bear in mind. One is those giving the legal officials or private citizens unlimited discretion, which is then used for evil ends. For example, in the antebellum United States, enslaved persons were under the full control of their masters, who could treat them as they wished. The other one is laws that justify, distract from, or hide infliction of intolerable harm. On that conception, for instance, Stalin's constitution that proudly displayed a hefty catalogue of rights engaged in window dressing while the political terror was happening on the ground. So far, evil law can be clearly distinguished from unjust law. But what if it is too distinctive, so distinctive in fact that it cannot be called law in the first place? What I call following Simon Levis, the rupture thesis. One instantiation of this thesis is rooted in external morality or substantive rather than procedural ideals such as fairness and justice. 
It can have stronger and weaker versions. The stronger version was famously expressed by Gustav Radbruch, who argued that Nazi law was not law in any sense of a word, as there had not been even an attempt at justice or equality. But what about other features Nazi law, in evil law at large, shares with non-evil law? The fact that it was promulgated, coached in legal language, and treated as binding by legal officials and law subjects. Radbrook's theory doesn't give a satisfactory answer to that. One can turn to a weaker version of the external immorality thesis proposed by John Finnis, who attributes that to Aristotle and Aquinas. Evil law is law, but only in a secondary sense, as despite being similar to non-evil law in the ways described before, lacked a crucial element central to understanding of law, its orientedness towards the common good. I'm not trying to question the central case method that Finnis employs, but I find its insistence on common good orientedness unsubstantiated. It makes more sense for me that law in a secondary sense would be law that doesn't work, such as law of so-called failed states, rather than law that works perfectly but for evil ends. Lon Fuller, however, would retort by switching our focus to internal morality instead. Internal morality, also known as the rule of law, consists of procedural rather than substantive elements, such as that laws are expressed through the medium of rules, said rules are prospective, stable and clear, and so on and so forth. In his famous reply to H. Le Hart's criticism of Radbrook, Fuller argued that Nazi law was not law as it failed to comply with some of the rule of law requirements, such as non-retroactivity, as the legal executions were later made legal by re retroactive ordinances, or publicly as there were repeated, sorry, publicity as there were repeated rumors of secret laws. This analysis, however, is ahistorical when we look not just at Nazi Germany, but also at Stalin's Soviet Union and antebellum United States, we see that rule of law was sustained even if the scope of its operation was diminished. Ernst Frankel's description of Nazi Germany as a dual state comprising the prerogative sphere occupied by political cases that were decided arbitrarily and the normative sphere in which the internal morality was preserved is more helpful than a flat out denial that the regimes discussed before even used law in any significant manner. My case against the rupture thesis in two of its instantiations shares a common thread. Evil regimes need law for various purposes. Law is required for more thorough coercion of law subjects, coordination for both evil and benign goals, legitimation of evil deeds, both to internal and to external actors, education and propaganda necessary for the evil regime to flourish, and forming of identities that are needed in order to sustain such an evil regime. Evil law's future thus depends on legality, and while the latter provides some limitation on wickedness that can be committed, evil regimes usually strike this bargain. I will conclude with a positive case as to why evil law is a term that should be used. Firstly, as I demonstrated before, it describes a distinct phenomenon from merely unjust law. Secondly, it helps us acknowledge an uncomfortable truth that evil regimes can successfully use legality for their own ends. Thirdly, this term is important beyond mere philosophical investigation, as it gives the victims of evil law a tool to frame that, uh, their experiences. Fourthly and finally, calling a spade a spade makes it easier to resist such regimes at the time or deal with the consequences later on in the process of transitional justice. After all, claims jurisprudence was eventually burned by the Nazis in 1943, one may think because it revealed too much. Thank you for your listening uh, and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you, Anna. So we have a question from the back. Thank you, Anna, for this thought-provoking presentation. I just wanted to ask you if, in your research, uh, you consider um, the definition of evil law or finding evil law in a context other than the case studies uh, that you've brought to light here, which really concern evil regimes, totalitarian uh, regimes from the past and whether you contemplate the existence of evil law in more democratic regimes under the way you're going about defining that. So thank you. So your question is the reason why I chose uh, slavery in the antebellum United States as one of my test cases, because uh, surely for all the faults of antebellum United States, 
uh, they were like drastically different from like Nazi dictatorship or Stalinist dictatorship. So this is m one of uh, my ways uh, at looking at um, you know evil uh, law, um, you know being prevalent in uh, liberal democratic societies, relatively liberal democratic societies. And I don't necessarily say that well all totalitarian regimes are evil or all evil regimes are totalitarian. I think the truth is more complicated than that. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I do have to wonder if your thesis on evil law as law, rejecting the arguments, for instance, of Aquinas and Finnis, is far too permissive of evil societies. Would, for instance, Kim Jong-un's North Korea be considered law uh, or any regime where a dictator wakes up, shoots his opponents, occupies the presidential palace and then can issue proclamations as and when he likes, is even something like that going to be law? And if it is, what would that mean for society in a transitional justice state? Because invalidating Nazi law as law was a very important tool for securing justice for ordinary victims of the Nazis atrocities. If instead we couldn't do that and had to say it was law, does that not rob us of that weapon? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you for your question. There's quite a lot to unpack there. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on North Korea, so I probably wouldn't be speaking to the truth of that example. But of course, um, as evidenced by uh, you know, Ernst Franke's treatment of Nazi Germany, uh, evil regimes do not necessarily have to rely on law like in every single case, because sometimes there are political cases that can be uh, better dealt with from, from the point of view of those evil regimes uh, uh, via extra-legal uh, instruments. Uh, but uh, I think that law still plays a role in such societies. Uh, as Ernst Frankel said, uh, the normative state supports the prerogative state, uh, and the normative state is essential for the legal system to function. Um, so I think I would probably uh, still say that uh, there is law in North Korea. It is just a law that is morally iniquitous and limited in its scope. Thank you. So, yep. Yep, so next up, we have a presenter who will be presenting remotely. So I will just get my Zoom meeting up now. Hi, Dee, can you hear me? Hello? Hi. Great, okay. So next up, we have Dee Chia, who's currently in Singapore and will be presenting on the performative dimensions of positioning artistic interventions in Singapore. So you may start now, Dee. Thank you. Right, so at the time when we were supposed to submit our abstracts for this conference, my research was indeed entitled The Performative Dimensions of Positioning Artistic Interventions in Singapore. However, as with all PhDs, uh, it has since developed and it is now, um, you know, uh, equilibrium positions theory and outline for a theory of inclusivity in the contemporary art world. Question is why this research, um, because this research took place um, because before this PhD, I worked at the Singapore Art Museum to facilitate museum education and programs to make the museum more accessible to the general public. So during the course of my work, I observed an increase in artists engaging in participatory and community-based art, which fulfills social and ethical responsibilities. I use the term art for good to describe this uh, phenomenon. However, artists whom I have worked with for art for good have shared with me that they encounter some form of tension 
during the course of their artistic practice. Some are, some are concerned about their reputation as uh, because of the participatory and community-based nature of their practice, their artistic outcomes often do not bear their authentic art, uh, artist signature. So as a result, some of them are worried about the possible consequences of their artwork not being collected and represented by galleries and therefore affecting their artistic reputation. So however, due to the increasing evidence of how arts benefit society, art for good is where the funding lies. So herein lies the tension. Artists are concerned that participating in art for good may not be ideal in terms of their artworks collectability and standing with galleries. However, community-based participatory art is where the bulk of art funding from the state and private organizations is parked. So on the other hand, there are some other artists who face a different set of tensions, issues to do with genuinely wanting to engage with underserved communities through art, but yet they do not have the know-how. So perhaps because to use art to engage the community, artists often have to take on multi-hyphenated identities. And a lot of times um, engaging in sort of do-it-yourself processes and uh, in this arena, my research has shown that apart from artists taking on the role of being a project manager and concurrently exhibition technician, producer, facilitator, there are at times also therapists, community mediators, counsellors and mentors to the communities which they engage. Um, it is an area which requires a lot of different skill sets to function. So hence, the primary objective of my PhD is to understand how all these additional social and ethical responsibilities impact the positioning of artists practicing art for good in Singapore. So as you can see, there are many aspects to this research and amongst other objectives, this research seeks to generate new knowledge in the sociology of art and contribute to positioning theory. So for the purpose of today's presentation, I will only be presenting the aspects to do with positioning theory. So for those of us who are unfamiliar with positioning theory, it draws attention to how interventions by intellectuals attribute certain features to themselves and to others. So inspired by Bert and Morgan, who has developed a framework for the study of intellectuals based on dramaturgical devices, I was keen to develop a theoretical framework for the study of positioning art for good. So amongst the research questions here, um, as we are focusing on positioning theory today, I will zoom in on just the question, what is the likelihood of artists engaging in the practice of art for good throughout their artistic careers? So the purpose of this particular research question is really to provide a data source for artists to surface the factors in their current realities, which perhaps make them change how they would position themselves and how others would position them. So the data collected corresponding to this question has enabled me to subsequently develop what is called um, the equilibrium position theory, which I will de uh, delve deeper in a moment. So in terms of methodology as part of the ethnographic process, for the past six months, I have participated in artistic interventions by artists in their early 20s to a 79-year-old artist activities. So I became a member of an art collective and I actually participated in a performance art piece. I also helped to make compost for a community garden started by underserved children and uh, help to test an art installation by visually impaired artists and attended an event called Lion City Divorces Club run by the, one of the artists whom I worked with for this research and just this Wednesday, I was at a punk gig uh, as part of the ethnographic process as well. So it's pretty interesting, I must say. So through my participation in the daily activities of artists, I have gained uh, insights through a more direct lens to investigate and uncover the different dimensions of how these artists who work in the community position themselves are, and are being positioned by others. 
So as mentioned, with the data which I have collected thus far, I've developed the equilibrium positions theory. I personally believe this theory applies to not just the art world in Singapore. It might be useful also in articulating an alternative view for positioning for society at large. So according to merriamwebster.com, Equilibrium is a state of um, intellectual or emotional balance. In other words, our poise. So therefore, to attain equilibrium, one must achieve some form of balance between two or more influences or powers or factors, etc. So in equilibrium's, uh, equilibrium positions theory, I have identified three dimensions that constitute the aspects of how an artist can potentially attain an equilibrium position, which is unique to the artist to which others are unlikely able to attain. I refer to these aspects as the dimensions of positioning. So the first is the dimension of constituency, which refers to the extent to which an artist sees himself, herself, or themselves as part of society at large. This impacts their sense of agency and the extent to which their artistic practice would be influenced and impacted by their views on social, uh, social issues. In other words, the more they feel strongly about being a constituent of society, the more they are likely to use their artistic practice to address issues through participatory and community-based interventions. The second dimension is what I refer to as contextual realities, and this dimension refers to the context in which artists find themselves living in and operating from. Contextual realities include the political, historical, and social conditions in which artists are at a particular moment in time when they are engaging in their community practices. The third dimension of positioning is a career trajectory. It refers to the path which an artist follows and progresses throughout their artistic career. Career trajectories may move forward, backwards, or even stay as it is, depending on the other two dimensions. Uh, of current reality and sense of constituency. So the data collected thus far from my fieldwork suggests that artists achieve an equilibrium position at the point where these three dimensions intersect. Therefore, equilibrium position theory recognizes not only that positioning is a multi-dimensional exercise, it is also cross-dimensional and intersectional. Another aspect of equilibrium position theory is that along the path of an artist's career trajectory, various states of equilibrium positions can be attained depending on how the three dimensions of positioning interact with one another. And this concept of having multiple states of equilibrium positions is opposed to the conventional theory of intellectuals or even us you know, as regular human beings only having only one peak in our career trajectories. So fundamental to the understanding of uh, equilibrium positions theory is the phenomenon of um, positioning dynamics, a term which I have coined to explain the process of how equilibrium positions are being plotted. So this process, as the term positioning dynamics imply, is a very dynamic and malleable process, so much so that at times, equilibrium positions cross over into the spaces of other disciplines. So this is where artists evolve and their art practice, uh, practices metamorphosize to chart new states of equilibrium positions and create new trajectories in spaces which are perhaps beyond art. So allow me to further explain the concept of positioning dynamics. Uh, Newton's second law of motion states that the rate of change of a body's momentum is equal to the net force acting on it. And therefore, relating this concept to the concept of positioning dynamics, Positioning dynamics therefore refers to a measure of the mobility of an artist's position based on the net force that is acting on the artist. So forces acting on an artist could be created either by a singular active thrust in their career trajectory or a more diffused force resulting from what perhaps um, I have uh, mentioned earlier, the multi-hyphenated identities which artists carry with them over the course of their careers. So let me conclude by saying that this theory 
might be first steps towards a more inclusive art world in Singapore, um, as the three dimensions of positioning provide platforms on which a myriad of um, significant issues which has plagued the art world since time in, immemorial, such as um, elitism, collusion of consensus, power, money, insularity, um, could be addressed. So the equilibrium positions theory advocates that every artist's equilibrium position is unique, multifaceted, and artists could attain more than one equilibrium position during their careers, depending on really their current realities and their sense of constituency at particular points in time. So with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't overrun. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yep, so we'll now be taking questions from the floor. Yeah, I'm the assistant. Any questions for Dee? The one back there? Someone just fidgeted. Because I can't see the audience, so I have no idea whether there are questions or not. It's lunchtime, right? <laughs> just before lunchtime. No questions we can break for lunch. <laughs> well, I have one for you, Dee. I was going to ask, because I know that you worked as a museum administrator, as you said earlier, right? How has, yes. that, how has that sort of identity worked in your research and the sort of intersection between your experience and now as being a PhD researcher? I, I think that's a, a, a really great question because um, to be very honest, um, because I worked in a museum and uh, I, I must say coming from the museum and working with the artists, um, at first I was very concerned that um, because museums, especially when I worked in a national museum, the power relations between myself and my um, participants uh, might be uh, a little, you know, um, imbalanced. But um, interestingly, I think uh, because of the ethnographic process that took place, I think um, it allowed also sort of a, uh, greater trust to be developed over the course of the ethnographic process, which is, um, yeah, in my study about six months uh, since it started. So I think um, over time, actually, um, yeah, uh, the power relations actually um, sort of uh, uh, didn't, didn't exist anymore. Um, I don't know whether that answers your question. Because oh, I think great. power relations between we, uh, between the researcher and participants are always uh, uh, you know a concern for for researchers, especially when we we are you know um, entering the lives of of our research um, participants. Thanks, Dee. I think we've got another question from Jane. Hello, dear. It's Jane. It was nice time I saw you. Oh, I hi, Jane. Hi. I can't see you though <laughs> no. from my screen. Um, I saw you earlier. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the, que the question I've got is whether the experience of artists working in the community is different depending on the medium of their art. Because you could see that a, a, a painter uh, and a sculptor uh, uh, and somebody doing performance art and, uh, and they might have very different concerns and experiences when they work within the community. Definitely. And um, I think that in itself was actually a very eye-opening experience for me uh, going onto the ground. And, um, you know, even though it is, uh, as you have rightly pointed out, you know, different artists working with different mediums um, respond to communities very differently. I even had an artist who was actually um, working uh, for the punk community and um, um, he, he is actually an uh, artistic uh, director of this uh, pretty established uh, institution in Singapore called the Independent Archive. And um, yeah, and, and, and that, that has been, uh, um, I would say, okay, from my personal experience, I would say um, I got to experience a lot more um, uh, my, my understanding of the definition of art definitely widened 
with with this uh, with this research process, and uh, to a certain extent, I would say, you know, art is not just sculpture, painting, performance art. It is it is also evolving as we speak, uh, by the day, and uh, with with definitions really constantly changing, and um, I think that that is also something that I am reflecting upon for my for my research because I. I find myself also entering sort of disciplines that are beyond art with the work that I'm doing and some entering sciences as well. Um, so therefore, you know, with, with the positions, uh, equilibrium positions theory, I'm also talking about this idea about, you know, art, um, the artist entering another sphere that is beyond art with, with their positions. Thank you, Dee. So that's the end of our first oral presentation session. And Is that thank it? you very much. Yep. yep. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good lunch, everyone. Yep. So thank you very much to all our presenters and also the questions from the audience. So now we are just at 12.30, which is the beginning of our one hour lunch break. So please feel free to grab some food at the foyer and we'll be back at 1.30.